So next on is me. I forgot to send myself a bio <laughs> and therefore I get the default smartly with a beard. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Economics 101. So my first question is, and I just want to quickly take a survey and ask who of you know anything about microeconomics, supply and demand, that kind of stuff? Anything. Like price determination. If I asked you in an exam to write five points on price determination and supply and demand, would you get like three, four out of five? Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, six, seven. Okay, so it's about two thirds of you guys know something about microeconomics, right? Um, who does not know absolutely anything about microeconomics? I don't think so. One, two, three, four. Okay, it's about four. Okay, so my, my talk today is mostly aimed at the guys who know nothing. So I'm going to go fairly slowly through Economics 101 principles. But for the guys who know a lot, I put in a bit of spice, so you'll see some new stuff as well. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to also just pose a question. Um, why are prices and markets so important? There's, there's two particular reasons um, that I can think of, off the top of my head. Um, Scholl's not allowed to take part. <laughs> no, you're, you, I'm not going to be a dictator. You can do whatever you like. Um, so prices, there's, there's two main things. The one is um, prices send some signals. And I'll explain how they send those signals just now. But prices send a signal. If this jug of water costs a thousand bucks, it's sending a signal that water is freaking scarce. Go find some coke or something else. Right? So prices send signals to the rest of the market. What should we produce? There's a big incentive if water is selling a thousand rand junk. There's a big incentive for somebody else to go find some water and bring it to us because clearly there's not enough of it and there's a big profit potential. So it's a signal to say this is what we want to have produced because it has a high price. Uh, there's potential to make some money. Bring the water. There's a scarcity. It's sending a message to everybody else. Be careful with that water. It's scarce. Okay. So when you eliminate prices, we have a thing called tragedy of the commons. People just use it, and then we have what we have in South Africa now, droughts, and uh, what it, it was load shedding, now it's water shedding. Or what? Like student shedding. Student shedding. There's a number, of, when government gets involved, things go bad, because they eliminate the, those price signals, and then people don't know how to act. You don't know how to save water. Uh, you get the message through the media, but that's also a costly way of doing it. Prices, when I say thousand bucks, you don't have to know the economic theory. You're getting the message, right? So that's the one reason we want prices. The second thing is there's scarcity. Almost everything around us is scarce, and therefore we have to ration. So imagine we have a small pizza with just four slices. Um, there's 18 of us. <laughs> How are we going to divide that up? There's not enough to go around. How, how do we allocate those pizza slices amongst 20 of us? And this has been a big problem for the world up until recently, and now we're all obese. So that's uh, problem solved. But we still have some scarcity left in the world, like... Uh, everything. Yeah, still everything, actually. So the prices have come down, though, which tells us it's less scarce than before. It's sending us a message. Um, my cell phone costs a little bit more than my original cell phone 15 years ago, but it can do a hell of a lot more. I'm getting more value for the same money. Um, so, how, But how do we allocate that little four slice pizza between a lot of us? There's three ways. One is we can pick a leader based on our cultural preferences, the strongest guy, or the smartest guy, or the most logical guy, or whatever our uh, pre predisposition is and say, the leader decides. So I'm going to, it's a pepperoni pizza. I'm going to give one slice to Stuart, one slice to Peter, because they look the hungriest. One slice to Colin, um, and one slice to Daniela. Right, so now we've divided up, but how happy are we as a group about it? Uh, Stuart happens to be vegetarian, so the slice is sort of wasted on him. Uh, maybe Garth is a lot more hungry. He would have preferred that slice a hell of a lot more. And now me as a dictator has gone and divvied up the thing in a really horrible, uh, ineffective way. So that's one way of, of 
doing it just simple allocation. The second way is to have a queue. So whoever gets to the queue first, they get the first slice. So whoever runs the fastest sort of wins. Uh, we saw that in Russia, big queues of lines in front of the bread shops. They eliminate the prices, they add a monopoly. And because of that, people had to queue. <coughs> you have to ration, you cannot eliminate prices. You cannot make education free. Uh, what you're doing is you're eliminating the price. We don't know how much education to provide because, or how much to consume as students because there's no price attached to it. Now, this is all very boring. And I can see all going, uh, a bit late in the day for this, this theory. So let me just do a little bit more picture drawing, which is even worse, because this involves maths and graphs. And then I'm going to get to the real practical bits. OK, so firstly, we're going to draw a very basic graph. We've got price on this side and quantity on this side. And now, because I didn't have pre-prepared slides, you guys can pick a product. Bananas. Bananas, right. We've got bananas. Now, there was a guy in the late 1800s, Leon Walra. He was uh, a French guy. He really wanted to be a, um, an author, but paperback novels. He wanted to do journalism and uh, casual writing and stuff. And his dad said, no, maths. Okay. <laughs> Um, he then went on and created uh, the demand curve, which is basically the higher the price is, the less of the thing we want. So if the price is high, you don't want so many of it, very few. Um, if the price is very low, then you want a lot of it. And if you connect the dots, you call that a demand curve. And that's basically telling you the higher the price goes, the less of the thing we want. And he had a bit of a formula to that. The graph not be a little bit like that, because otherwise it'll end up with um, <coughs> unlimited quantity and it'll be free. It should be a bit of a... I'm going I'm to get to that because you've got a good point there. Um, I'll try and rush and get to that more quickly. The other side of this, also Leon Walra's work, is he said, as the price comes well, as the price goes up, there's a bigger incentive for people to supply. So when this water jug is a thousand bucks, high price, there's a big incentive for somebody to go find a lot of it and to start selling it, right? And if the price is low, there's not such a big uh, incentive for people to go find new water, in this case, bananas. Um, so there's very little of it at a low price being supplied. You connect the dots and you say this is supply. And there's a little formula to that. So up until there, very boring and not very interesting. Laura then went on to do other stuff. A few guys then looked at this and sort of simultaneously in France, England, and Germany came up with the idea of um, identifying the bits on this graph. And one guy, or <coughs> three of the guys said, hang on a second, where these things intersect at that spot there, these markets are going to match each other, or the, these sets of people are going to match each other. So the guy going out and looking for water, and the people who want to drink the water, or in this case the bananas, are going to match up in terms of quantity at that price. So if that's, let's say, 10 Rand for a bunch of bananas, then at that particular price, 10 Rand's for a bunch, let's say one bunch, the supply and the demand are going to be equal. And that's going to be your market price, and they call that equilibrium. Or a better term, market clearing price. Or market clearing. What they mean with market clearing is all the products you produce, so in this case, one bunch, when you sell at 10 Rand, the no, whole, it's all going to go. One bunch at the bottom there. It's 100 bunches at 10 Rand. Or you can go half a bunch, two bunches. Right. OK, fine. Uh, sure. Let's make it easier. Let's say 10 bunches of 10 rands. So it's one rand a bunch, right? No. Uh, no. <laughs> 10 rand. Price is price per unit. The price per unit is on the left hand. At the bottom is the quantity sold. <laughs> oh, yeah, total, yes. Total quantity sold. In other words, it could be 100 million bunches of bananas. Not one okay. bunch of Not one bunch of it, it doesn't particularly matter. Let's say 100 bunches sell at 10 rand each. 
sell at 10 rand each. So you generate 10 times 100 bunches, 1,000 bucks in revenue. Okay. Good. Thanks so for correcting me, Sean. If, if you offer 100 bunches or, or uh, at, at 10 rand each, a, a bunch is 10 rand. You can expect yes. to sell them all. If you price any higher than that, you'll sell slightly fewer. If you price any lower than that, you'll sell more. Right, so now Trevor's preempting what I was going That's to right. get to a little bit later, but let's do that quickly on the graph. So let's say, no, I'm not going to do it now because that's going to derail the whole, the whole thing here, actually. Um, let me just quickly point out two other things. So Charles is correct. This is called market clearing because at that price of 10 Rand, all 100 bunches will sell. Because the guys supplying bunches of bananas are happy to sell 100 bunches at 10 Rand. That's where that pink line crosses the price. When the price is 10 Rand, they're happy to sell 100 bunches. The guys wanting bananas at the same time, they're happy at 10 Rand to buy 100 bunches. If the price was higher, they would obviously buy less and then they would be left over. Now, here comes the interesting bit. Great theory, but how does this actually happen in practice? So like I said, prices send signals. So if you know this jug of water is worth is going for a thousand bucks, somebody's wanting to sell it for a thousand bucks, that's sending you some messages. You don't need to know the economic theory. Now, when you look at this economic theory, you're a farmer, you grow bananas. How, how do you know how much land to allocate to banana plants and how to grow that, that many bananas? If you're on the demand side, how, how do you know? You're a market agent. Because you're the person that actually deals with the sale. So you're going to on-sell the bananas? Well, th th there will be a person that facilitates that transaction. Because the farmer right. normally doesn't actually go along and, and advertise it um, outside his farm. Directly. He so will actually take it to, to the market. And the market mm -hmm. agent will say, I've got 10 bunches of bananas. And uh, the market agent uh, and the farmer says, look, what do you want for them? And he'll say, well, I want all of them sold at 10 rand. And what if he says, no, I, I think no, 20 is more reasonable. Yeah, but he has a good, you see, that's the expertise the market agent has. He now okay. understands the market. So there's a, a number of ways that you can try and figure out where that equilibrium point is. Because what I'm trying to get at is, how do you know to produce this much and sell it at that much? Well, In practice, how do you know what that price trial is? Trial and error. So trial and error. Um, so let's say trial and error is one way. So basically groping in the dark, one is Expertise. to use an expert. History. Uh, you can do history. History and predictions. And then there's Nike. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, it's going to sort of... Okay, so now here's the challenge. You want the, the real answer. I'm going there, but go for okay, it. No, no, if you're going there, then you don't want the real answer. Sorry, I didn't follow. Say again. Do you want the real answer of yeah. how a producer decides what the volume is that he needs to produce at that market? I was going there, but if you want to no, no, go no, there, go. No, do what Trevor does and piss on your parade. No, that's fine. I've got, I've, I've got 16 more points. That's fine. And I'm pressed for time. Go for it. The marginal revenue, that's marginal cost on your, on your cost curve. That is the volume uh -huh. that you need to Okay, so there is a cost calculation, uh, uh, including uh, match to the marginal revenue. Okay, but how does that happen in practice? What? How? So the guy, the guy knows that, that those bananas cost him eight bucks a piece. No, it's got nothing to do with cost. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the farmer's cost. I was a farmer. So what you do is you take your bananas to market, let's say 50 bunches. You go to the market, you put your 50 bunches down. Now you're taking a fat chance. You had 50 bunches, that's all you could load in your little truck. You go there, you put them down. What price do you put? What are you trying to 
so on that? How do you, 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 know? you take a guess. So let's say you take 50 bunches and you mark them 12 rand a bunch. Somewhere over there. What's going to happen? Your demand is over here. So your demand is above. Uh, people are willing to pay more over there. They're willing to go to 13, but they're not going to tell you. You put your 50 bunches down there, and you mark them 12 bucks. Everybody's going to come, hey, bargain. And they're going to take some, give you your 12 bucks, but none of them are going to say, I was going to be willing to pay 13 bucks. But what you'll find is, at that 12 bucks, they would have demanded quite a bit more. So around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, your bananas are gone. And there's people still coming saying, where's the bananas? You've run out of stock. That's a message that tomorrow bring more or up the price. Either one of those two. So tomorrow you come back. And now you still do 12 bucks, but you bring, instead of 50 bunches, you bring 60. Now you're basically clearing it. So at 5 o'clock when the market closes, your bananas are, have run out. Have a lot of stock. Uh, you have made a little error there. Yes, I did. At 12 rand, your supply would be much higher. I'm ignoring the supply now because I'm looking at one single supplier. Oh. Okay. Okay. Right. At, because now remember, at 12 bucks, supply was going to be way over here. So what Charles is saying is there's other guys also selling bananas. So if, mine, if I'm selling at 12 bucks, Mine's running out at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a guy next to me who also brought, he brought 100 bunches, and he sees me making money out of 12 bucks a bunch. So he's also going to do that. And eventually, between the two of us, we're going to realize ah, there were too many bananas now at that price on this market because people only bought 60 of them at 12 bucks. So that's over there. That's what they bought. But we actually brought, as all the producers together, brought that many, 150 bunches. And then we sit with too much of it. So then we have to go home and say either up the price or reduce the quantity or lower the price. Because if you lower the price, then you're going to sell more of them. Okay, so this is a, a process of groping in the dark. You have to actually go to the market, put down your bananas, gauge. Am I left over with some at the end of the day? So tomorrow, higher price, bring less? Or have I run out too early? Therefore, tomorrow, bring more up the price? And you sort of negotiate that back and forth until you eventually get to this. Now, the important part here is that nobody on the demand side is telling you anything about how much they want or what price they're willing to pay. You can go do market research. You can use an expert. You can Trial and error is basically what we're doing. But you can look at history, use an expert, do some cost calculations. That's going to give you some indication of what you can do and uh, what kind of demand is out there. You can do some market research. So haven't you realized yet that your supply curve is nothing else than the combined marginal cost of all the producers? Yeah. So the answer. Well, it's part of the answer. Because I can see Shaw getting highly upset. <laughs> I think he's pissing on your parade. <laughs> you know what? I'm happy with that. And that was sort of my goal because normally I come to these conferences with something that's a little bit provocative, and I, if I provoke only one person, that's fine. Um, and I, yeah, sorry, Shaw. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> what I wanted to get to is, your standard economic theory is going to take you up to a point, but they're not going to tell you how this actually works in practice. There's a guy taking stuff to market. Our local spire is a very good uh, indication. They got new management. The new management took, took all the baked goods away and replaced it with subcontracted baked goods. And they took the same quantities as what the previous owners had done. And nobody bought it. 
even at the same prices because it, it had a different look and feel. They were catering to a specific market, the previous owners. It was established, they knew what they were doing. The new guys then started playing with the price and the quantity and after about three months they got it sort of right. But it's a completely different combination and you have to go groping around. So one day I walk into the spa, there's 20 milk tarts. All at prices I think are fairly exorbitant. The next day I get there, there's only two at a completely different price. And these guys were trying to find out what the hell is the market thinking around these milk tarts. It really took them three or four months to find that, that uh, balance. Because now if you get into that spa early in the morning, there's about 12 of them. And the price is pretty much stable. And consistently in the afternoon, if you get there, they're all, all gone, maybe one left. So they found that balance. And the real only way you can find that balance um, is by putting the stock out there and seeing at the end of the day what's left over, what is it, and then either up or down the price, up or down the quantity. Okay, because the Trial price is, say again? Trial and error. Trial and error. Right. So that's point number one. Um, why is this important to us, though, as libertarians? Um, I think two reasons. The one is that a lot of the social ills we have to deal with. The government and people in authority try to manipulate this mechanism, price mechanism, or replace it, and try and improve life and our social condition by these mechanisms. So the one way is, I'm going to do the same graph quickly, uh, price, quantity, and let's say um, let's, I, don't want to, I don't want to use an example that's too obvious like electricity or steam locomotives, steam locomotives. <laughs> but I have all the rights to the rails. So, um, let me just think now. Let, let's just take something normal like bread, okay? Um, or milk tarts. Milk tarts are great. So you've got a supply of milk tarts. There's not a lot of regulation in that market, so fine. Um, and let me use a different color for the demand side. So on the demand side, high price, low quantity, because you don't want as many at a high price. And you've got a market price, which people find by groping around in the dark. Now, what government does quite often is they say milk tarts are of national importance. We cannot live without them and therefore we are going to forcibly lower the price. Milk tarts will no longer cost market price of 12 rand per milk tart. Uh, we are going to fix the price here at 8 rand which we think is reasonable. Now what happens there is the guys supplying milk tarts are going to say, hold on a second, my marginal cost and revenue, whatever. I'm not making as much money at 8 Rand as I was at 12 Rand. So now some of these guys are going to eject themselves from the market and rather go chicken farming or something. So instead of doing 100 milk tarts per day, they are now going to do only 80. That's on the supply side. The guys who want milk tarts used to pay 12 bucks. Now they're paying 8 bucks so they're going Hey, hang on a second. This is a bargain, I want more of it. So the demand side at that price is going to sit over here. People actually want 130 of them. Now the problem here is, once government has fixed the price there below the market price or the clearing price, um, it sounds like a really great idea. In the free market, Biltarch used to go for 12 bucks. Government has said, we'll step in. Eight bucks a milk tart. Everybody thinks, genius idea. Problem is, supply has dropped to 80. The demand has dropped, uh, has increased to 130. Now we're 50 milk tarts short. And that's where you suddenly get people standing in queues or that regressing to the other means of rationing. There's scarcity, you have to ration. The best way is a market price because then everybody negotiates and they find an amicable solution. The guy who's not willing to pay 12 bucks just doesn't buy it. He doesn't feel compelled to not buy it. Whereas when the government puts the price at a, at a different level, you're going to have a shortage. 
Okay, you're supplying 80 people, 150. There's a shortage. So the opposite could also happen, where, um, for example, uh, we want a maximum price on something. Labor is the best. Labor is the best. Minimum wage. I'm going to use the same graph. Um, let's say that you could get a guy to work for you for 120 bucks a day. So let's just do that. Right. 120 bucks a day. Now, the, the fact that he is willing to work for you the whole day and you only pay him 120 bucks means he had no better options. If he had better options, he would go there. The fact that he's accepting 120 bucks from you for that day's work means that's his best option. Okay? So you're offering him 120 bucks for, for the day. He's happy to accept it. Now, if government goes and says, you have to pay this guy 150 because 120 is unacceptable, what's going to happen is your demand side is going to be only an eighth of a day or 80 percent of the day and the supply side is going to increase so basically what's happening here is there's going to be more people wanting to work supplying labor okay at that price 150 people are going to go i'm going to get off my lazy butt and try and earn that because that's worth it 120 in there not worth my time 150 yes so there's suddenly more people in the market the guys paying that price are saying it was worth it at 120 bucks <coughs> but at 150 no thank you some of them are saying that so now your demand for the labor is lower and your supply of labor is more so basically you've got a surplus now of labor and that's in the labor market that's called unemployment right so and you can they, there's only those three options Either government forces the price too high and you have a surplus, too much is being produced, people don't consume it, stuff is lying idle, or the price is forced too low and then you have a shortage, not enough is produced, people have to kick and scream and fight and burn to get what they wanted instead of having a price mechanism, or you leave it to the market and we find a peaceful resolution to it. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I have two or three more comments. Um, I'm, I was sort of aiming for quarter to four, but let me just show you two or three quick things. <laughs> our, time, our timekeeper is talking, so I'm just... <laughs> okay, which one? <laughs> All of them. What time is the next thing? Um, we've got Paul on at four, but I already told him we're running a little bit late. Okay. Um, so just two things very quickly. If you want to correlate these demand and supply curves back to reality, you have to also look at the numbers of people. So Vivian showed us a bell curve earlier. I don't know how many of you guys know bell curves very well, but it's basically that kind of shape where you say the average person would do whatever the case may be. So here we've got numbers of people or num numbers of units and on this side, let's say we have price of bananas. So the average person is willing to pay 10 rands a bunch. And there's some nut job who really loves bananas. He's willing to pay a thousand bucks over there. And there's some guy who really hates bananas, even at um, zero rand, he won't eat it. He's allergic. Even at one cent, he's not going to touch that banana. Okay. So those are your, your extremes. The average person is in the middle there. Now, if you take this as your demand curve, this is how much people want bananas. And you also have suppliers, so at, let's say, 10 cents, there's pretty much nobody who can supply bananas at that price. And at um, 1,000 bucks, there's quite a lot of people who would provide it, but um, that's not reasonable, it's not sensible. People aren't going to go out, plant bananas, and then want to supply it at that price. So you should typically have a supply curve which looks something like that. 
with your average supplier wanting to sell bananas at, let's say, 12 rand. Some are happy to do more, some less. If you then accumulate these bell curves, you're probably going to get something like that. your demand and depending on whether you invert the sign or not either that for your oh, sorry that's demand that's supply or uh, something else if you invert the sign but basically your demand curves are going to be a bit squiggly because they're the accumulation of a bell curve okay so those straight lines you get in the textbook aren't hundred percent correct um, what else was there uh, I wanted to talk about self-regulation, but I've, I think I've covered that quite a bit. And then random walk is more of a macroeconomic concept. I just wanted to mention that because somebody brought it up on the Lipsa forum a, a few weeks ago. And within this process, to think that market prices just go on a random tangent and fluctuate up and down, I think is a symptom of not understanding this process of interaction properly. and thinking that there's no reason behind the market. So quite often I, I watch the 8 o'clock news and they say, um, the JSE was up 300 points on the back of interest rate <laughs> announcements in the US. And I think to myself, what the hell? Everybody didn't have one single reason for buying stocks. That might have been the main reason for some of the movement, but how much of it was that movement? Is 300 of the 360 points related to that interest rate announcement and what constitutes the other 64 points movement. They never tell you that on the news. They just said the whole market moves 600 points because the interest rate in America changed. And that's crap because I have, a, for example, a friend of mine moved to Germany and the day that he moved his money to euros, uh, the euro f fell spectacularly, or the rand fell spectacularly to the euro. So it would have fell even more if he hadn't bought euros at that stage with his rand, or less. But nothing in the news said, because um, Jerry went and bought some euros, it was slightly less of a fall than it otherwise would have been. And yet that is the case. So Very long news broadcast. <laughs> well, that's the thing, and I, I just wanted to, to also mention that when you see these things in the news, it's a very broad representation of something that's a lot more complex. When you get down to the nitty-gritties and the detail, it's actual real people reacting to stuff in their day-to-day -day lives. A jug of water that's suddenly very expensive, people automatically react. You don't have to know the economic theory, but it's nice to actually have that picture in your mind. What's going to happen when government sets the price of bread at two rand a loaf. Shop floors are going to be empty. We won't have bread because nobody can sell at that price. What's going to happen if government raises the minimum wage uh, by 200 bucks? More people are going to be unemployed. It's stupid simplicity <coughs> because all you do is go demand, supply, price too high, and petrol is a good example because somebody said to me, but oh, government fixes the price of petrol and there's no shortage. Well, there is sometimes when the oil price spikes, they pay more for the oil, or for the petrol, but the price only changes the first Wednesday of the next month. So what happens? You end up standing outside the garage. That hasn't happened for a while because oil has been at $50 for ages and their calculation is still based on some old figures. But if government sets the price too high, we just pay too much. They supply us with less. We want a bit less and ultimately we end up paying a hell of a lot of a lot extra it's only when the price is set too low that you really feel it in the quantity <coughs> because you go to the shop and it's empty um, when they set the price too high quite often you just end up paying more than you should um, i had a bunch of other things to say as well um, but i think we should go over to one or two questions and then leave it at that Yeah. Yes, I think there are a couple of issues. Uh, one is that supply, that has been pointed out by various Austrians and economists, is actually not a curve at all, but a vertical line. It's a, it's a fixed static state of affairs. The amount of 
the Nadas at any given time, is that's that. You can't increase them if demand increases. The other one where I disagree with Shah is that if there's anything to do with marginal cost at all, firstly, no one actually knows what the marginal cost is. You have on one farm cattle, bananas, uh, holiday cottages, uh, apples, uh, apricots, and no one knows what the marginal cost of any one of them are. I'm married to a woman who produces products called paintings. And uh, the, she has the, hasn't the foggiest to die with the marginal cost is you could never know. So what she does is she tries to find buyers. She prices herself too high compared to what demand there is. So she doesn't sell that many paintings. She sells a few at a very nice price. Uh, and if she tried to work out what she should charge for those paintings, uh, well, the answer is it's, uh, she just does it by absolutely feeling and intuition, which is what this restaurant does with a cup of cappuccino. They have no idea what the marginal cost of that cup is. There's no way of working it out. All they do is that if the cappuccinos are not selling, they likely raise, lower the price and raise the price of something that is selling. And uh, so I don't know if this lets us know how it's done, and I guess that's why the Austrian school says don't try. You can't know. Uh, yeah. By the way, I want to respond to that. But I like the Austrian school. There's one or two minor things I sort of disagree on. The one is that they, the, the Austrian school tends to get it right there and then extrapolate a bit to all models of uh, mathematical modeling which I disagree with, I think there is some space for mathematical modeling. Um, I wouldn't go that far, I think it's a bit extreme, but I think they got it right in this case. Sure. I completely agree with uh, Leon. Uh, say he was a good econ economist and that therefore we could accept the, uh, the shape of the curve there. Um, on the second question, um, marginal cost is very easy to ca calculate. You take the, the total cost, which is made up of fixed cost and variable cost, and you work it out. You've worked it out 10,000 times on South African railways in order to be able to price um, what an additional person should be paying, what the marginal cost of the additional person would be. And we use the formula and the calculation, so you can work it out, whether it's actually correct and so on. Um, some serious kind of mathematics involved in that, which I just quite don't understand. Well, let's just say we profoundly disagree. It is simply... Oh, oh, uh, okay, okay, can I ask you two questions? Is it, uh, are you able to determine the fixed cost of, um, if we produce st stuff in this room, um, what rent we pay? Is that possible? Well, let me ask you. So that's the fixed cost component. You've got a good mathematician over here. Why don't you sit down with him and work out for it what the cost of this past talk was? Is it the, cost the cost of the talk we've just heard. You, um, you know what? They, this is a very subtle difference. Uh, that could we just get, get Garth in here, Garth? Um, is it possible to calculate uh, the marginal cost of an item? Yeah, not all items. Let, let's, let, let's say it is. Let's make the assumption that it is. You've now calculated the marginal cost. Is it oh, going to uh, sell? Uh, uh, and uh, to perhaps this is a final point. Um, a, hundred, a series of 120 videos um, developed by a place called uh, some university in the state, um, but the one division is called the Marginal Revolution University. The first 26 videos covers all these stuff for anybody that's interested in how this work. And then there's a hundred more videos on very technical marginal cost calculations and so on. Okay, so I'm not saying that it depends hugely on what the item is. Yes. If, if sure, absolutely. If you're, no, if you're Every a, item's got an unmarginal cost. No. If you're in a very competitive market and you have to really get down to sense differences between you and your competition, then the marginal cost is important and you have to drive that down because you're competing on pushing down the cost so that you can maximize your output. And the, what I'm asking is, how do you determine a price <coughs> within a normal market? So a street vendor wants to sell apples on the side of the street. We're not talking about perfect competition in that situation. Um, so, but I hear what you're saying, Charles. I think, I think you've got a point, but I think it might be limited, in my opinion, to very, very competitive markets. 
the, the challenge is if you know the costs, is that the price it's going to sell at? Definitely not. Definitely not. And that, that's my point. And I think that's sort of the point that Leon was making as well. From my totally layman's perspective, I presume you're saying the price is what the market will bear. The cost is what it costs to produce. Yeah, it's two different What will the market, market bear? That's what you go for. But that, that's the price, and the cost is how much did we how have to spend to create to that widget? I, I want to get back to this, but Peter, Seems pretty simple. The other thing you've got to consider is what is being sold. Mm -hmm. Now, bananas. if it's if it's in terms of a perishable, like a bananas or a piece of meat or something like that, it, it, it has a very short lifespan, so it has to be sold. Mm -hmm. So that has one set of rules the way the market operates. Then if you have something that you can put in a warehouse and may be able to be sold <coughs> five years later um, at a market-related price because it may be a brick or something or a lintel. And, and it's not well, going to... Well, the challenge with that is there's still a cost to it because you've now got capital... Yes, no, so I, you I understand you've got variable costs to, cost to store. If you get to the end of the day and you see I've got 10 bananas left, they're going to be brown tomorrow. You better either dish them out for free or make the price so low and, that and the few customers exactly that happens. have the opportunity yeah. so that's exactly what happens and tomorrow you're going to try and have less of them yeah. but if you end the day with five extra nuts and bolts uh, you're probably going to say well I can leave them over to tomorrow but I'm not going to order more from my supplier until next week yeah. where you yeah. were going to do it on Thursday for example. But, and then you've got the other type of product that you sell which is a financial instrument mm -hmm. which isn't something physical mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's it's a, a not a, it's you, you you buying something which you can then use to negotiate something concept. else. Yeah. It's a concept, and and those things of course are the most dynamic, and they're the, the most reflective of real pricing, because if a price of a, a well traded share on the stock exchange or any instrument is the true reflection of its value. Then it's taken mm -hmm. all the knowledge. Of all the people out there that no, are no, this is the interesting to who, to who is it value? How do you know? You say that's the real value to who? No, to anybody who's going to trade there. At, at that, that moment. Point. To the most recent buyer. So, if you, if you go, I disagree with that. Because if you go to bitex.co.za, you'll see they've got a thing there which they call the price cliff. And what they've done is they've, they've basically said, we're selling bitcoins. And the price of Bitcoin can range from zero to infinity, basically. And what they do there is people put down offers. So I'd like to buy a Bitcoin for $600. And somebody else says, I'd like to sell a Bitcoin for $800. And they just accumulate all these offers. So what you'll see there is um, basically one cent, to the, one cent to the Bitcoin and over here, uh, something ridiculous like a um, hundred thousand dollars to the Bitcoin and then they've got what they call the price cliff which looks something like this which is currently six hundred dollars is the going rate so they've got all these offers so the moment the price moves up to six hundred and ten dollars so this whole section here moves up. So these guys making the offers is now. To buy an offer to sell. Yes. This is selling. Yeah. And this is buying. And when they intersect the trade, that takes place. On a moment and if you look at it, that's basically those bell curves. Yeah. This is your, your supply curve and this is your demand curve. And I'm saying that's what you were saying is this is the real market <coughs> price at that particular time. For those individuals, For those individuals. trading at that I'm time. I'm saying no, One it guy. cannot be. Because there's a guy over here who is now currently willing to sell at $20. And there's a guy up here now willing. He made the offer to sell or to buy at 100000 but only one trade takes place at that moment, at that price. And that right, so the that's the price. market price, that's not the value. Because there's a guy who values that Bitcoin at 100,000 and there's another guy who values it at 20. But the trade doesn't take place because there's no offer and there's, there's no buyer exactly. at that price. So every time there's <laughs> one guy at a time and that is the market. Leon? No, I think I had the wrong way. Do you agree? No, no. It's a slightly different point I want to make. Oh, okay. I think there's, that happens very easily with all of us and I'm just as guilty, but I want to point out you cannot confuse value with price. Mm -hmm. The whole point about the Austrian school is 
value is subjective and the price is in fact never the value yeah. because there would be no transaction if it were. Yeah. The person selling values the, the money more than the, the product or service, the buyer values the product or service more than the price, so neither side considers the price to be its value. They both have a different opinion. <coughs> One thinks the value is above and the other one thinks the value is below. That is why there's a transaction. Yeah. Otherwise, there would be no transaction. Willing buyer, willing seller. Yes, but <laughs> it's not the value. It's different for everybody. It's subject. It's a price. It's a value. The value is different. The value is a purely subjective, unarticulated... You can't value. measure it. It's, it's not quantifiable. It's not measurable. It's purely a, a feeling. But yeah. you guys follow what you were saying because there's a very nice example. I think I think I got the example from Shop. If I want to sell a let's say a glass of wine or a can of Coke, or whatever. If I say five bucks, I'm, I'm selling this at five bucks, and Shop says yes, I must be valuing this less than five bucks because I'm willing to take five bucks from him and give him this. In other words, I think I'm going to be better off. I take the five bucks. This is worth less. So you go for it. At the same time, he has to think this is worth more than five bucks because he's giving his five bucks and taking the wine. Well, it's clear. It's worth it's 20, 20 bucks. I'll, I'll or 20, 20 bucks. bucks for you. I don't know what it's worth to him. All I know is it's worth more than five bucks to him because he took the wine instead of the five bucks. That's all I know. And we call that sort of a consumer surplus. Yes. So... Sorry, Peter, I was being a bit technical, but the market price is never the value. Well, uh, the okay, the point it depends on how you define the, the value. Point, mm. The point on your supply-demand curve, which let's note is a line and not a curve, and in fact it's probably is an S-curve or something yeah. like that, but that aside, the point about it is that the, where the buyers come in, all of them have a subjective value of something more than the price. Some a lot more, some a less more. So there's yeah, no unanimity amongst buyers. No, uh, the, to the other side. It's on the or, other side. It yeah. doesn't matter though, the principle is the same. To the sellers, they value the product at a, ra at a, 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 a mirror image range of different opinions. Yeah. So if each individual falls somewhere within that triangle but no two of them on the same spot. Right, so if, if we're selling a whole bunch of things over here... Uh, Every consumer price, would have paid somewhat more than they in fact paid, but you have no idea how much more. Yeah. And every seller would have sold for somewhat less, but you have no idea how much less. Right. Okay, I have a few more things to say, but I think that was the essence of it. I just wanted to, to get the message across that subjective value, we cannot know certain things Prices are a really good indicator of how we should act in the market. And government, by trying to fix it, makes things worse because they can only create surpluses or shortages or make us pay too much. If they just left it alone, we would get the message from each other uh, through prices and uh, trade to everybody's benefit. Because in that trade, if it's not to our both benefit, it's not going to happen. And that's best related to labor. Labour, anything yeah, else? Because from, no, but I think so. Well, well, as long as there's as long as there's scarcity, when you see violence, you can be guaranteed that somebody has manipulated the quantity or the price in some way. That's so education. When people go burning down universities, it's because there's no peaceful negotiation of a price there. It's been fixed by somebody externally to that to that agreement. And they do it because the price is not zero. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Um, so let's take uh